Well, hello, friends. Welcome to Unboxing God, Episode 2. I'm McCall. In Act 2, Scene 2 of Romeo and Juliet, Juliet stands on her balcony and wonders aloud about the importance of a name. O oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's a Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called. Retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo doth thy name, and for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. Here Juliet laments that the only reason she can't be with her one true love is due to his family's name, Montague. She notes that a man's name is not any part of who he is and makes an analogy to a flower. Wouldn't roses smell just as nicely if we called them anything else? The word doesn't make the scent sweet. It's the rose's very essence to be fragrant. Finally, she longs that if Romeo had a different name, he would be her perfect match. So she urges him in her thoughts to drop his name, which is, after all, no part of who he is intrinsically, and take her in its place. Do you ever feel like the biggest hurdle to connecting with a higher power of your understanding is the common title English speakers the world over use for it? God? Is the word itself the stumbling block for your spiritual growth in program? If so, you're certainly not alone. I stand proudly by your side, and I am glad that I do. Otherwise, you know, I'd never have felt inspired to walk down this particular path of spiritual journeying. God is supposed to be all loving, all caring, all knowing, a protector of the sick and downtrodden, a supporter of the weak and the poor. But for some, there's just something about that name, that title, God, Lord, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Whatever the name, the all-loving, all-caring, all-knowing creator of the universe who can restore me to sanity has a name and one that I can pronounce? Really? Today, I want to share my own journey of trying many paths and using many names to find the one that I could call the higher power of my understanding. The search for a name unencumbered by my own negative associations with authority, with church, threats of hell, eternal damnation, feeling like I need to drink kombucha or chai or wear a robe and know the right movements and prayers. Along the way, I want to share with you a few stories from some of my friends, many of them in 12-step programs, who went through similar experiences looking for the God of their understanding by any other name. In a relentless effort to fill my personal God-shaped hole, I've journeyed down a lot of faith paths and soul-seeking endeavors, from synagogues to Catholic school and ashram, Wicca, shamanism, all the way to good old JC. Some periods felt more authentic than others, though my search was always sincere. But no matter where I landed or for how long, I never really felt that I could relax fully into the arms of a higher power and feel safe, protected, loved unconditionally and without reservation. For that, I needed a more personal connection. So when I finally returned to the 12 steps of Al-Anon full force and fully grappled with this question of who is the God of my understanding, I couldn't find a way to address him, her, it, them, I'm not really convinced that pronouns matter much, so I may be inconsistent throughout this podcast, but that's me for you. 
You know, it always felt like God was hiding from me or something. Like the true nature was accessible, but buried underneath all these different traditions and titles, names, not to mention all the baggage I've collected along my various travels through different faiths. It kind of felt like I was looking for some needle in a haystack. Like I was searching in one of those children's books. Where's Waldo? (sighs) Then it hit me like a ton of bricks. Where's Waldo? Waldo. A name for my higher power that I can love, that makes sense. Now, does this mean that I worship some cartoon character with glasses and a cane and a little beanie? Of course not. Remember, Juliet, the name doesn't change the essence. God can be no less God by me calling them Waldo, but it helps me. And if it helps you, then uh, by all means, use it. Waldo can be Waldo for you, too, if you need. See, when I call God Waldo, it makes me feel like I'm connected in a personal way. And it also makes me smile. And I truly believe that the God of my understanding wants me to be smiling. And this helps me. It wasn't until I experienced a personal relationship with this unique God of my understanding, Waldo, that my vision of what is really possible began to expand, and my access to uninhibited conversations with others about the divine truly began. The interpersonal connections that my playful experiments with God have fostered are some of the most real, raw, and magical relationships I've ever known. Let's hear from a couple of those people. When I hear a God of your own understanding, the thing that actually comes out to me isn't some specific deity per se. It's actually a phrase that I picked up in one of my college psychology classes, which is our God image. And a person's God image can really shift and frame the way that they interact with spirituality, with other people. I know for me, my God image was kind of messed up. Um, At worst, I believed that God was vindictive, cruel, kind of on a regular daily basis, just detached detached from me, detached from my life. Oftentimes, you know, I found that my God image mirrored the image that I had of my father, where he was there, but not quite as there as I would have wanted. And he heard me, but didn't actually really listen. And that shifted the way that I interacted with the God of my own understanding. It wasn't until coming to Al-Anon that I noticed it and had an opportunity to see that higher power a little differently. Through Al-Anon, the God that I'd always heard about, the one who was kind and patient and forgiving and called people to better, I saw him there in the room, or the virtual room, rather. (laughs) Um, That was where I saw him for the first time. Hi, this is Brittany C. from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Step two is about coming to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. It doesn't necessarily mean we believe that he, she, it actually will. And it also doesn't mean that we have to define this power or even turn our will and our lives over just yet. But to have an open heart and open mind to seek this power greater than oneself. When I was 18, I came to believe in Jesus. I was tripping on LSD with a boyfriend at the time. I was not raised with any certain faith. If anything, I was raised with karma. What goes around comes around is one of the sayings my dad always taught us and made sure to point out examples in his life and from my own actions. Anyway, before that experience, I would outwardly claim God was not real. Then when I came to believe... I literally thought that now I was saved, something terrible was going to happen, and I was convinced I would not wake up in the morning. Well, morning came, and there I was, alive and well. 
Looking back, I believe it was the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. I started going to church with my boyfriend and his family. Even after we broke up, I continued going to the church. I was heavily involved in service and literally tried to do and implement everything I was learning. Then I started seeing red flags when I started questioning things. When I brought my now husband and started pursuing a relationship with him, the pastors brought me into a serious sit down and warned me that God wouldn't bring me a husband so early in my walk with God and that he was like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Honestly, I believed them and broke things off with my now husband, but the al in me persisted. After all, he was sober and seeking God too. Do you know how long those words rang in my head? Especially after we were married, had our first child, and then he relapsed, and come to find out that he has a darker addiction to pornography. So, so many times, I went back to the words of those pastors, believing that I should have listened to them, that I, in fact, married and had children with a wolf in sheep's clothing. We went to that church for the first two years of our marriage, but red flags kept appearing. It got to the point that the God of my understanding didn't fit in their box. I was serving the church and the leadership and their needs, but I had lost God and didn't understand why I was doing so much for the church, yet felt so far away from God. We left that church and tried for years to find a new church home. It seemed every church we went to, and there were many, God told us no. We still had strong faith and, if anything, drew us closer to him despite losing faith in a church or churches altogether. See, I thought we had taken God out of the box that churches had built. The God of our understanding was so much more loving, forgiving, accepting, and grace-filled. It wasn't until I came to Al-Anon did I learn that I had just built a bigger box. I still believe in Jesus and the God of the Bible, but I have many questions and doubts that maybe the Bible even boxes God in. How many times has it been translated and manipulated by man? What has been left out that would answer so many questions that still linger? How many other religions I have studied and seem to find truths, but also many, many man-made strings attached? I'm coming to believe that maybe, just maybe, there are golden nuggets of truth sprinkled far and wide, and maybe, just maybe, by turning my will and life over to the care of God as I understand Him, and being on the active hunt for truth, that is where my faith is being built. As I read step three for the first time, something happened in my spirit. All of the confusion, all of the hurt and religiousness melted off, and I turned to God as I understood him and told him, God, I believe in you. Come and reveal to me your true self and your true nature. I walked into the rooms of Al-Anon and found the fellowship that I have been seeking for so long. Honest, broken, beautiful people who are so broken yet have no agenda, who are truly seeking to heal through looking inward and seeking upward to find truth and serenity, true humility, real raw emotions, natural beauty, deep pains, yet a drive to believe that we can be restored. My definition of God has morphed and changed since coming to al Truths have been revealed Communication with God is more abundant than the previous 12 years of having faith. One day at a time, little by little, as I hand over bits of faith, God has shown faithful. It has taken much exercise on my end to work out that faith muscle, to stretch and break so that God can show up and repair, build, and strengthen that muscle. It takes action and openness on my end to allow God to reveal to me his true self and true nature. 
friends, this is Harper, McCall's daughter, coming at you from our makeshift quarantine recording studio. Sorry to interrupt your deep spiritual listening, but a girl's gotta make sure her mama brings home the bacon, so I'm here to tell you guys about Anchor. Anchor is a podcast recording app, which is free, and ain't nothing cheaper than free. It has a variety of creation tools that let you record, edit, and customize your podcast from your mobile device or computer. Anchor will even distribute your podcast for you on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all those listening apps, so you can feel like a professional podcaster. The icing on the cake? Every time someone listens to your podcast, you make like a whole half a cent. So thank you for those shiny new 99 cent store shoelaces episode one provided me. Rate, review, and share Unboxing God so we can afford the other shoelace. (laughs) But most importantly, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. I have named the God of my understanding Amelie. I love that name. And my way of understanding God or my higher power is they are in my deepest heart and they are the core of who I am, connected to the universe. Amelie is my inner wisdom. And Amelie contains the words I am, which I love. Hello, my name is Brother Matthew Paul. I'm a Catholic religious brother, and my pet names for my higher power are Sweet Jesu, in like the Latin for Jesus. I just call him, Oh Sweet Jesu. Or sometimes for God, I just say, Oh my father, my mother, because I think God is both of those things for me. Thanks for doing this. God bless. Hi, I'm Amy, and I'm from Tennessee. Today I want to talk to you about how I came to know my higher power. When I first started on the journey of figuring out who I am and what makes me tick, I was confronted with a question. Who or what do I consider as my higher power? I really, really struggled with this question. I kept hearing everyone talk about God, and to me that meant the Christian God. I couldn't get on board with that. Um, There were too many negative feelings from my past. So when directly asked the question, my response was, uh, you know the universe. But that didn't really feel right. The universe is huge. Not that the concept of God isn't, but people go to church to feel God. They have services and Bible studies and such. I was opening this up to everything. And so how would I or do I or could I connect with my higher power? So I really wanted to explore this and figure out how how that could be. So this began my journey. I am a nature lover, a nature lover. I am pulled by the moon and calmed by the water. I love to walk and run trails and be among trees. The more I thought about it though, the more I realized that I feel more connected to a spiritual being when I am around water and better still if I am among trees and around water. So, as I said, I'm pulled by the moon, and the moon affects me, like, a lot. The moon controls the tides. So, as I begin to listen to everything around me and try to find my higher power, I realized that as I was walking down the road, in the car, listening to music with friends, um, doing yoga, anywhere, I would just sit and try to be very mindful of what I was hearing and seeing. I wanted so very badly to connect with my higher power. But on a particularly hard day, a very emotional day, I found myself going to a familiar place where I would trail run. Admittedly, it had been a little while since I had been there, had not been running, Um, but I wanted to go. It's my happy place. As I pulled in to park, there was a glare coming off um, off of the water. The sun was reflecting off of the water, and I hadn't even thought about the quarry being there. I walked over and I climbed onto some rocks and I sat over the water. So I'm sitting among the trees, feet dangling over the water, looking out at reflections. I watched the water ripple from the small fish or anything that fell in the water. And I just talked. Really, I prayed. And then I sat and I listened. It was this afternoon that I connected with my higher power, who I now call Mona, for moon and nature. It was this day that I felt such a connection 
and such emotion from just sitting in that spot and listening and crying and cleansing my soul, basically. I don't have to be at the quarry or even outside to connect with her. But now that I know how it feels to connect with her, I am definitely more aware of all of the ways in which she speaks to me. My name is Beth, and I live in Indianapolis, Indiana. And the only name that I've ever used for God is my Heavenly Father. Hello, my name is Mike, Grateful Al Anon member from San Antonio, Texas. I didn't like the boxed gods that were forced on me early in life, and now I choose to call my god water. This comes from a reading called Waves or Water that was written by a Vietnamese Buddhist monk named Thich Nhat Hanh. In a short excerpt from this, we do not have to go anywhere in order to touch our true nature. The wave does not have to look for water because she is water. We do not have to look for God. We do not have to look for our ultimate dimension or nirvana because we are nirvana. We are God. The power of this reading for me is in the simplicity of the analogy between a wave and water. Me to my higher power. I believe I'm just a temporary instance of this universe that can perceive and attempt to understand itself. And as a wave, I just need to pray and meditate to understand the ocean's will for me and the power to carry that out. And that is why I call my higher power water. Thanks for allowing me to share. Hi, I'm Nicole D. from Omaha, Nebraska. I call my higher power God. I have attended evangelical Christian churches since I was in third grade, getting on the church bus by myself. These churches taught me to love everyone, even though they are absolutely wrong if they don't follow the Bible. I let my church climb up the ladder ahead of me, while I loved others and let them climb the ladder behind me. I want to climb off the ladder and join the circle of fellowship, but I'm afraid not to know where my place is. I'm a work in progress. I don't call God anything. The word is a useful shorthand for explaining certain phenomena or inspirations that I have. But it is just shorthand for something much bigger. So I left the church of my childhood because I knew from a very young age that judgment, condemnation, and control were human. I required compassion and honesty and freedom from any deity or fellowship I was going to mess with. But when I left, I felt so lost. I still had a very mystical and spiritual way of moving through the world. The divine or God has touched me in paranormal ways, or maybe that was delusion and imagination, and that's okay too. And the divine has touched me in earthly and practical ways as well. So we're done with the idea that religion and spirituality are at odds with science. Yes, I was driving to the Sierra Nevadas with my daughter. She must have been about 10 or 12. And the clouds broke open and there was a rainbow. And I said, look, baby, it's a rainbow. It's a miracle. She said, Ma, it's not a miracle. It's just science. Well, Just because it is explainable by science, that does not mean that it is not a miracle. Nature is a great place to see the divine. Birth, survival, death, in nature and in life, for us humans, these things are unavoidable and they are essentially correct. I've stopped worrying about who or what God is. I spend my time trying to listen, asking how in this moment, in this reality, I can think and respond in the most honest, most compassionate, healthiest way possible. I don't call God anything. It's all God. Hi, I'm Johanna. For me, God is so... Supreme. I mean, there is some mystical, magical force that holds the universe together, that animates all of life. I mean, call it the force, call it the great spirit, call it the Tao, call it the supreme being. 
it seems pretty far out there. So in order to actually commune with that, sometimes I really like an intermediary, like my guardian angel, or, you know, pick a Hindu god, there's a bunch of those, or Jesus, or God. I mean, there's a lot of different names that I use as a tool to kind of get through. Um, I like to think of my angel as a good one, right? Like, or I thought when I was a kid, I had a guardian angel, so why not that? That seems easy for me to understand. And then that can communicate to all that is, which is really far out there and a little hard to understand when I'm really just focused on, you know, the next right thing. My name is Maze. I'm a grateful Al-Anon member. God to me is a warm, glowing light, and they are all encompassing. But also, I need to be still and listen for their quiet voice to hear the next right thing for me to do. Uh, back when I was a kid, God was this old white dude in the sky with a beard sitting on a throne, and Jesus was next to him looking like a hippie, pleading our cases to God. I do like Jesus as a guy. I think he was a good person to emulate. I love the idea of a goddess, who is generally a mother-type figure in my mind, who is also there in a glowing light with loving arms. But that's uh, who God is to me. Shares like these help remind me that as much as I think I'm alone in my struggles, there are so many of you out there who feel just the same. If you feel alone in your quest to discover who God is, I hope these stories will comfort, even inspire you. I think it was somewhere in about third grade when I discovered Richard Feynman. He's an American theoretical physicist, and he won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1965. Lots of his sound bites still resonate in my brain, but there's one about names that he explained in an interview. Names don't constitute knowledge, is what he says. And although I do fully agree with him, musing about pet names for the unnameable sure does feel exciting and inspiring to me. All the kids were all walking in little parties with their fathers in the woods. Then the next Monday we were playing in a field and the uh, kid said to me, say, what's that bird? What's the name? Do you know the name of that bird? I says, I'm the slightest idea. He said, well, it's a brown-throated thrush. He says, your father doesn't teach you anything. But my father had already taught me about the names of birds. He once we walked and he says, that's a brown-throated thrush. He says, know what the name of that bird? It's a brown-throated thrush. In German, it's called a Fliegenflegel. In Chinese, it's called a Qinglongtong. In Japanese, a Tohatohara. And so on. And it when you know all the names in every language of that bird, you know nothing, but absolutely nothing about the bird. And then we would go on and talk about the pecking and the feathers. So I had learned already that names don't constitute knowledge. It's in knowing the name of something. There's a Sikh prayer called the Job Saib. It's their morning prayer, and it's said as a recitation, but also as praise to God. But instead of names... They list the qualities of who God is based on the person who is observing God. So if God has healed your mom, maybe God is the healer. If God has blessed you, he may be the blesser. And I really like this idea. My mother-in-law has this poster at her house that has the names of God, like Elohim and El Shaddai which also are qualities that God has more than just names. And I like this idea. It's almost like all faiths are rivers that are destined to merge into one great ocean. Whatever you can call, think, believe, or perceive about God, when you stop and consider the idea that we mortal humans can put an accurate name on our higher power, it's really kind of laughable. In the Jop Saib, that morning prayer of the Sikhs I was telling you about, some of the qualities of God that they praise are as follows. God is metaphysical, beyond time, eternal, unborn, uncreated, self-existent, and without form, feature, color, or contour. Do you agree? 
Here's another. God's manifestations are universally pervasive. God cannot be confined to any particular place, land, country, religion, race, garb, body, or name. No one name could possibly capture all that we mean when we speak of the God of our understanding, the being that encompasses love, grace, kindness, but also devotion, determination, power. Call it God, Allah, Krishna, even hope, promise, help, Bridget, Water, or Waldo. A God by any other word is still as sweet. Albert the Great once said, Wisdom and understanding enhance one's faith in God. And that's the idea here. I'm truly hopeful that your faith has been increased just a little bit by gaining a little more wisdom and understanding than you had at the start of this podcast. Until next time, I'm McCall. Take care. Unboxing God was written, directed, produced, and edited by me, McCall, and my husband, Kyle Lawrence.